Turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 11. We're going to start at verse 1. As you're turning there in your Bibles, Jesus is talking about prayer. He's talking about prayer. How many of you know that I heard a guy one time that uh, in ministry one time, he said, every failure that I had in my life was a result of prayerlessness. And how much time do we really spend in prayer? And how many of you know that prayer is a conversation with God? And like I heard one say, you're with the all-knowing, all-powerful God. What are you doing doing all the talking? Now, you have to talk. And you have to express some things to the Lord. But we need to be listening. It's just communication. Amen? So prayer is important in our lives, and yet I think that we, I think that we negate it. And so Jesus, in Luke chapter 11, beginning at verse, verse 1, he says, Now it come to pass, as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. I think that's interesting. Here are the disciples. They've seen the miracles that, he, that he's done. And yet, what are they, they're not saying, Lord, teach us to do more miracles. They're saying, Lord, teach us to pray. So it, it just struck me as I read that. Teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. Verse 2, so he said to them, When you pray, say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. And we all know this as the Lord's prayer. But it's, it's really the model that the Lord gave us to pray. Now, <clears throat> what happens is religion comes in and we hang it on the wall. We put it over our entryway. And there's nothing wrong with that. I, but it's not meant to be a plaque. And it's not meant to be a ritualistic recitation. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed will be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is. Heaven gives us this day our daily bread and give us our trespasses. We forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine kingdom power and glory forever. Amen. Whew. I'm good now. No, it's a model to come to him as Father and hallow his name. All right? Now, I don't want to get into breaking all, all that down, so you're going, to have to, you're going to have to figure that out for yourself. But we came to him as father. Okay, and then you go on down. Let's go to verse, let's go to verse five. And he said to them, Which of you? He's still talking about prayer. He hadn't changed. He didn't say basically, and forgive us our trespasses, and we forgive those. Amen. Moving on to the next subject. He just continues on. He's still talking about prayer. And he said to them, Which of you shall have a friend? And go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has come to me on his journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he'll answer from within and say, Don't trouble me. The door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give, give to you. Now, this is a contrast of God as friend. Okay, this is a sorry no count friend. This isn't talking about Jesus. This isn't talking about, it's, it's a direct contrast, but he's talking about a friend. Not a very good one, but a friend. We've all got some like that. Verse 7, and he will answer from within, say, don't trouble me, the door is now shut. And my children are within in my bed, I cannot rise and give to you. I say to you, though he will not rise and give to him because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence, he'll rise and and give him as many as he needs. So I say to you, now Jesus is given the contrast. So I say to you, ask, and it'll be given. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it'll be open to you. For everyone who asks, receives. Everyone who asks, receives. And he who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, it'll be open. You know, that... Everyone who asks receives. And yet we, sometimes we don't see the manifestation. So what's stopping it? 
What's stopping our receiving? He, is he a liar? Is God a liar? We just have to get bulldog tenacious about this and say that Jesus said what he meant and he meant what he said. Everyone who asks receives. I can just hear the religious folk going off. Well, you might receive a no. You find that in the scripture. In Christ, all of God's promises, is this a promise? Or yes, and amen, which means so be it. So that's a, that's a fallacy. That's a lie. It's a religious tradition. And how many of you know Mark 7, 13 says, it's the traditions of men or the religious traditions that make the word of God of no effect. So if you believe that you receive, you just receive to know, guess what? You ain't gonna look any further for the answer. You're not gonna dig in. You're not gonna press in by faith. Because if that's what you've been taught, if that old religion has taught you that, guess what? You'll quit. You won't keep pressing. Well, Lord, I mean, well, brother, sometimes you just have to say, if it be thy will, God. Really? That's a prayer of dedication. That's a prayer dedication of your life. That's the only time Jesus said, if it, if it be thy will. Nevertheless, thy will be done, he said in the Garden of Gethsemane. That's a prayer dedication. If you don't know the will, you just need to shut up. You don't need to be praying. That's where you just go like this. If you don't know, that's why when you pray, you just need to shut up and listen and let the Holy Spirit tell you what the will is and he'll show you through his word his will is in his word it's called the last will and testament or new testament and the first will and testament or the old testament I mean if we if this was our natural will and testaments from our ancestors dear God we cut claw cuss and fight and everything to get in there and get what everything says that is ours in the will but we get all religious about God's will. Sometimes he do, sometimes he don't. Never know what God's going to do. His mysteries to perform or some junk like that. I don't mean to get on anybody, but it's, I don't like that. It's not the people that say that. It's the spirit behind it. And meanwhile, they're dying. They're broke. They're sick, divorced, all kinds of issues. And I know, how many of you know, the, the, the word says hope deferred makes the heart sick. I understand when you've prayed and you've stood and you believed and it didn't happen or you, you haven't seen any manifestation of it. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. But then it goes on to say, but when the desire comes, it's a tree of life. Man, I'm telling you, when you do get that breakthrough, you are eating gunpowder and spitting bullets because now it becomes a tree of life in you. You can't hold yourself back anymore. I say to you, ask and it'll be given. Seek and you will find. Knock and it'll be open to you. For everyone who asks receives and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it'll be opened. If a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? Or, you know, I always think of the old religious tradition that says, well, God killed your kid to teach you something. Broke your dishwasher. If a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, he offer him a scorpion? If you then being evil know how to give good thank gifts to your children, how much more in this, this gospel, in the gospel of Luke, it says, how much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? But in the gospel, I believe it's Mark, it says, how much more will your heavenly Father give good things to them that ask him? So that's the intent of what he's talking about here in prayer. 
He wants to. He wants to bless you. He wants, but you need to see what his will is. And let me tell you something. His will is better than you can come up with. And really what's happening is we line up with the book of destiny that's in heaven for our lives. That he wrote about every one of us. He says he knew us before our days were formed. When none of them were fashioned, but he wrote them in the books. It's your book of destiny. I, I believe that's Psalm 139. And so he wrote it in your book of destiny. And it's not, well, you live to be 20 and kick the bucket. It's a good destiny. But what we got to do is we have to, we have to flow in agreement with that destiny. Amen? You can't be off doing drugs and doing all this other stuff and expect to flow with your destiny because you're going two different ways. It's, it's a fork in the road and you're going south. So we have to flow with the fork that God has for our lives, the path that he has predestined for our lives. Now, does that mean we're all going to go to heaven? We don't have, no. He has a path set for you, but you, if you don't agree with it, and it all starts with getting born again. If you don't ever accept Christ, if you don't ever accept the grace that he poured out on the cross, then you've gone the wrong way and your book of destiny is not fulfilled. Does that make sense? It's not an automatic thing. You have a part to play, but it's faith and you receive by faith. For by grace are you saved through faith. And not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. All right. So here he's talking about prayer. And we in the body of Christ have done a pretty good job of knowing God as Father and knowing God as friend. But we haven't done a very good job of knowing him as righteous judge. And so turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 18. He's still teaching on prayer over here in Luke chapter 18. When you get there, say amen. Then he spoke a parable to them that men always ought to pray and not lose heart. So here he is again. He's still talking about prayer, that we ought always to pray and what? Not lose heart. Don't grow weary and do it. Galatians 6 9. Don't grow weary in doing well, for in due season you shall reap if you faint not or don't lose heart. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. Remember? But when the desire comes, it's a tree of life in Proverbs. Then he spoke a parable to them that men always ought to pray and not lose heart, saying, there was a certain city, a judge, who did not fear God nor regard man. Now again, we're going to do a contrast. He's not, this unjust judge is not Jesus. I've heard it taught in religious traditional circles that this is Jesus saying no. This is, not, this is an unjust judge. We all know that God is the righteous judge of all. Verse 2, saying, There was a certain city, a judge, who did not fear God nor regard man. Now there was a widow in that city, and she came to him, saying, Get justice for me from my adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, Though I do not fear God nor regard man, yet because the widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she wearies me. Then the Lord said, hear what the unjust judge said. Hear what he said. And shall God, listen to this now, perk your ears up, write this down in your notes. And he says, hear what the unjust judge says. And shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. He will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Will he find faith on the earth? 
If the Son of Man came today, would he find faith on the earth? Or would he find us cowering in a closet with a mask on? I didn't get any amens over here, so I'm going to go over here and say this. Will he find faith on the earth today? Or will he find us cowering in a closet with our masks on? We know. We've seen. We've seen the devastation of that. We've seen it. Of, of COVID-19. That's just another name for devil. Every time I hear the word covid I think a legion. Just a demonic name. COVID-19. It's a name that has to bow at the name Jesus. But here's what else I want to talk about right there that sticks out to me in that scripture. And shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him? We have a history with God. He's talking about people who have a history with God. Not Christmas, Easter, and what's the other one? Maybe it's just Christmas and Easter. Maybe, if you don't have a party to go to. Now, I know I'm preaching to the, I'm preaching to the amen section. Y'all are all here on a time change day. But maybe somebody, maybe somebody on the television is an Easter and a Christmas Christian. And as long as they keep it short. So it's those who come to him and have a relationship with him. And he says, will he not avenge them speedily? Amen. So now we see God as father. We see God as friend. And now we see him as judge. That judge thing. You know, I mean, the throne room of heaven, right? You, you, start, you start thinking, and how many times does it talk in the Bible about courtroom? Well, we're going we're gonna to start addressing a little bit of that. Let's go to the first one, 1 John, 1 John, chapter 1, 2, I'm sorry, 2. 1 John, She's already got it up there. I'll, I'll, I'm still trying to turn pages. My little children, these things write to you, these things I write to you, that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate. Advocate. Do you see that word advocate? Where do you hear that? In courtroom, legal terms. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is our advocate. Okay, now let's go to next scripture, Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, I want to start at verse 22. I just want us to see all of the places that we see God as judge, a righteous judge, and we see it in a courtroom setting. But you've come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable, an innumerable company of saints, of angels, to the general assembly, all right? General assembly. That's a courtroom term, right? That's a judicial term. To the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator. Again, another legal term. Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks, this is important, to the blood, to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. Do you remember when do you, you remember when Cain slew Abel? God said in Genesis, he said, Abel's blood cries out to me from the ground. You see, the blood speaks. The blood speaks. Abel's blood cried out to the, from the ground to God. 
of murder. And then it says, when we have Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling, Jesus' blood that speaks better things than that of Abel. Let's continue on. First John, this is Bill's favorite verse. He quotes this a lot, and it's a good one. First John, chapter 5, verse 14. Now this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Now, okay, I don't have a problem with he hears us like you're hearing me right now, okay? But he hears the case. He hears us. It's a legal term. Now this is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. He hears the case. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the, what? Petitions that we have asked of him. What do we do? We petition the court. So he hears us, he hears the case, and if we know that he hears us, then we have the petitions that we've asked of him. Okay? Hang on with me just a little bit longer. I just, I just, I just want to lay some foundation. Let's go to Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7 verse 9. Are you there? Say amen when you get there. Daniel chapter 7 verse 9. I watched till thrones were put in place. And the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated, and the books were opened. Now that was a heavenly vision of Daniel in heaven, what was going on. It's a courtroom setting. It's a courtroom setting. 1 Peter 5.8. 1 Peter 5.8. Be sober. Be vigilant. Because... Your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Now, there's, there's a couple of things I want to bring out in that. Be vigilant because your adversary, the word adversary there in the Greek is antidikos. And the word antidikos there means one who brings a lawsuit. That's the literal translation of that word. One who brings a lawsuit. So... Satan goes about and brings a law seeking whom he may devour. And how does he do it? By bringing a, an accusation to the court of heaven. He brings a lawsuit. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tie this together. Just, just go with me for a little bit further and I'll start tying it together. But I want you to see these scriptures. So he says he brings a lawsuit seeking whom he may devour. He says, doesn't say who he can devour or who he will devour excuse me but he, who he may devour and you know the scripture in James it says submit to God resist the devil and he'll flee from you alright alright so one more Revelations 12 10 we'll all know this one when we see it we've said it for years Revelations chapter 12 verse 10 Then I heard a loud voice saying to, in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren. Again, accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. And they overcame him by what? 
by the blood of the lamb. Remember the blood that speaks better things than that of Abel? The sprinkling of blood that speaks better things than that of Abel? They overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. By the word of their testimony. Now, again, I don't have a problem with you getting up and busting the devil's head open with a testimony of how you got healed, saved, set free, and delivered, and now your life's great. I believe that's what it's talking about too. But it's talking about our testimony in the courts of heaven. And they look how it says, the accuser of the brethren who, who accused the brethren day and night, and it's looking back at all of mankind. He goes about accusing the brethren day and night. What's he doing? He's bringing accusations. He's bringing cases to the courts of heaven against you. Well, okay, so now, What's he doing? He's bringing cases against your sin. That's why we need to confess our sin and plead the blood of Jesus over it. He's bringing an accusation against your sin. Well, God, you can't do this because I have a legal right. Because see, God's, God, God gave the general overall picture is God gave authority to Adam and Eve, right? They punted. They gave it back to the devil. And so now, only through the blood of Jesus do we take our rightful. When we step into the kingdom of God through accepting Christ, do we come back into having our legal authority here on the earth. He's called the prince of this world. Satan is. And he still goes about seeking whom he may devour by bringing an accusation in the court because we still, we're born again, we're going to heaven, but guess what? We still will sin. The Bible says if you say you don't sin, then you're a liar. There's no truth in you. So what happens is he, he uses our sin against us. Or, here's a big one. Life and death are in the power of the tongue, and you that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Proverbs 18, 20 and 21. A man's belly shall be filled from the fruit of his lips. So what do we say? We speak things, right? So, all right. Now I'll bring it down to a personal note to start putting it into context. Several years ago, my youngest son, I kept praying for him. And how, how many of you know an intercessor is someone who intercedes on their behalf until they can do it for themselves? Amen? And so, man, I, I, I prayed for my youngest son because I knew he was not living the way that I'd raised him. I knew that he was off, he was off with the pig slop. I knew that he was, he, he was skirting. How many of you know that all of us have a nature at times that, you know, we, we, you know, we just... We get right up, we toe the line of the chalk before we step over into disobedience. God said, oh, y'all quit looking at me like y'all are all religious, like not me, brother. I'm serving God all the way. I've died to the flesh. Really? So that car that cut you off in traffic the other day, you said, oh, bless them, Lord Jesus. I speak blessing over you and your children and your children's children. No, what did you say? You cursed them. You may not have cussed them. You said, you sorry, stupid idiot. Don't know how to drive. Going to cause a wreck. You're cursing them. That's still a curse. It just ain't what we call in Texas here, cussing them. And some of y'all cussed them. I was riding home with Bill just the other day. But I was, I was cursing them too with Bill. We didn't cuss them. We didn't cuss them. We cursed them. We said, look at that peach over there. Isn't she a peach? She, Bill was on cruise. And we were going by, and it was rainy. And we'd get right up there to them. How many of you, especially, especially the, I, I know you guys are from the Dallas area. Dear Lord, they all do it down there. We're passing them. And all of a sudden, they speed up. Or they just get right beside you. And you're like, 
got the cruise, come on 80, and I was coming up. I was overtaking you like a racehorse. And all of a sudden, I got right up here, and you sped up. She's got her phone down there. She's looking to, in the rain, I don't ever do that, do y'all? <laughs> I got a mirror broke on my pickup right now from doing that one day and hit the reflector. <clears throat> but anyway, we weren't blessing her. We were cursing her. So that's mild. That's the mild. But still, you know, you begin to speak things over. What are you saying over your kids? What are you saying over your marriage? What are you saying over your folks? What are you saying over your, over, over, or you get the message, right? And so what happens is then we've given Satan a legal right, an inroad in to come in, and he has a legal right. He says, well, even their own kids say that about them. Or even their own parents say that about them. And so when, when Reese was, you know, living out there on the edge, I'd get frustrated. I mean, I would lecture him. I would preach to him. I would try to shame him. I tried everything. Threaten him. Boy, you come home and you'll be sitting on a tractor. You won't ever see the light of day off the tractor. You know, I mean, all that kind of stuff, you know. None of it worked. So I was praying for him. And it just, it, it, it wasn't, it wasn't working. There was a frustration. I can, go, I can go back to my phone and I have Bible scriptures. All thy children shall be taught of the Lord and great shall be the peace of thy children. Train up a child in the way he's going when he's old and not depart from it. Uh, there's one where it talks about your sons shall come back from afar. And I don't, I don't mean a fire, I mean a far. For all you East Texas folks. They'll come back from afar. And I mean, I, I had his name and I had those bookmarked in my Bible app on my deal and I'd, I'd just speak those over him. Nothing changing. Matter of fact, it just got worse. And then I heard this teaching on the courts of heaven. A guy by the name of Robert Henderson. Some of y'all may have heard of him. And actually, how I heard about it was Marianne went to the chiropractor in Amarillo. And many of you know Dr. Shane. I hadn't asked him for permission, but I'm just going to drop this down on him. I'll give him, I'll give him uh, creds or whatever. So Dr. Shane Hand in Amarillo. Marianne goes to his office. And we really, I mean, I, I, did, I had never heard of the guy at this time. And so Marianne comes back. She went, went to the chiropractor. She came back and said, Rog, You'd love this chiropractor I went to. Said, first thing he did after he got all my information, he says, come back in this room back here. And he got me back in the room. And he just sat down and he preached to me. He preached healing to me. Preached the gospel to her. Preached healing and deliverance to her. And then said, hey, there's a guy coming to town named Robert Henderson. He's teaching on the courts of heaven. You really got to get a hold of this. This is good revelation, blah, blah, blah. I mean, he's talking like a fire hose. And then he popped her back. I said, man, that's my kind of chiropractor. I mean, he's doing more than just clicking that little old pen, you know. This guy's doing some, he's doing some deep stuff. So anyway, it was right here during this same time. It was, it was God-ordained for us. And so I start watching this guy online. And his testimony is this. He had a son who was in the ministry. There are, you know, he's like fifth generation preacher, I think. And so this son is in the ministry. He's a grown man. He's in his 30s. And his wife leaves him. And he goes through a divorce. And he just falls into this deep, dark depression. He had this church growing, you know, and the enemy came in, stole his marriage. And, and he just basically just gave up, sat in a dark room in his house. And he said, man, I couldn't get him out of it. It just went on and on, I think, for a long period of time, like a year, maybe over a year. And he said the same thing. He said, I tried to shame him. I tried to browbeat him. I went over and tried to kick him out of bed. I told him, you know, I tried to preach to him. I tried to encourage him. He said, I tried everything. Nothing worked. And he had started studying about the courts of heaven. And, and the Lord said, Take him, bring him to my courts. And so he began to pray over his son and to intercede. Because he had always gone to God his father. And God is friend. You remember when Abraham prayed over Sodom and Gomorrah? They said he, God said Abraham was a friend of God. 
And so he, he, he knew God as father and he knew God as friend, but he had never known God as judge, the righteous judge of all. So he said, I just went to praying for my son. And I just went to repenting. I think he, he, he probably went to repenting over some of the things he had said to his wife, just, just like I had said things out of frustration about my son to Marianne that we had just in our private talk. And I know the power of the spoken word, but you just get mad and you say stuff, you know, instead of just bite your tongue. But we'd given legal access. We'd given legal access to the devil. And so I just, he, he went to talking about, I just went to repenting for all the things I'd said over my, and he said, Lord, your word, your blood speaks better things than that over Abel. I repent over what I said about my son, and I put that under the blood. And then he just, everything the Holy Spirit brought to him, he repented of. And then the Holy Spirit started speaking to him about his ancestors. How many of you know about generational curses? And so then he started uh, repenting for his ancestors' sins. You know, I think he said, you know, uh, one of his granddads, the Holy Spirit showed him that his granddad had uh, by accident killed somebody. And so he'd taken their dreams. And so he just began to repent over that. And, and just as the Holy said, I never even knew that granddad. I didn't even know his name. And so just over and over again, he just re began to repent as the Holy Spirit showed him. He said the whole thing took about 15 minutes. And then, and then after he repented and applied the blood, confess your faults, he's faithful and just to forgive. And so then he, he began to, he began to prophesy to his destiny. All the things he'd been, he'd had years and years of words spoken over his son that he, the Holy Spirit brought them all back to him. So he began to prophesy about his destiny. And so he began to speak that forth. After I'd done, after I'd taken care of the legal issues, then I began to agree with his book of destiny. And I began to give testimony of his destiny. And he said, and then I just, you know, he said, I went to bind it and loosen, binding the devil off him. Because then, but here's what he says. How many, the revelation that he got is how many times we go to the battlefield rather than the courtroom. We're too quick to go to the battlefield for warfare when things pop up in our lives. And have you ever had situations where you went to the battlefield immediately and it got worse? It's because we didn't have the legal issues in place. We had given Satan our ancestors or something. We had opened the door to Satan to where he had a legal right in there to stop the manifestation of the breakthrough. And so it got worse because we're, we're operating out of order. How many of you know today before we go to war, we go to the governmental bodies and get judicial action before we go to war? By the way, our governmental system came from the American Treaties of Civil Government with 1,800 scriptural references in that work that our Constitution our, and our government was founded on. So anyway, all of this took about 15 minutes. And he, he said, I just felt like I felt a release. So he said, I went about. He said, two weeks later, my son called me one day. And he said, I happened to write it down the day I did this. And he said, my son said, Dad, you're never going to believe what's happened to me. He said, what? He said, that darkness is lifted off of me. He said, I feel good again. I want to preach the gospel again. He said, well, when did this happen? He said, about two weeks ago, all of a sudden I got up one day and I was a new man. We did the same thing with my son. And we saw this. Remember that word says, and will God not avenge his own elect speedily? And we saw a turnaround in his life. My mom, my mom several years ago, 
she had a, an issue where she got really sick there for a while, and I was the nurse. Now, I'm, Marianne says I'm not the most compassionate nurse because it's kind of like, suck it up, buttercup, come on, you know. And so I was over there giving shots, insulin shots, because she was so weak at the time. And, and she went off to go stay at my sister, and she was doing terrible out there. And Marianne and I were just visiting one morning, and I said, let's take her to the courtroom of heaven. You know, it's kind of like, duh, I could have had a V8. I mean, do y'all ever have those moments? You know, you teach this stuff, I preach it. And then once in a while, I just, it's like the Holy Spirit has to go, duh, here's your sign, you know. And, I, and it was kind of like I had a duh, I could have had a V8 moment. And I said, Marianne, let's take mom to the courts of heaven. So we began to take her to the courts of heaven. And, you know, 10 minutes. And all of a sudden, my sister called that afternoon and said, boy, mom's made a turnaround. She's doing great today. I said, yeah, I know. And, and I told Marianne, I said, why did we wait so long? I don't, I don't know. I can't answer it. It's called stupid. Stupid. Can you say stupid? Somebody said, we already knew that about you. But we need to not be so quick to rush to the battlefield before we get a verdict. And so we just need to seek out. I believe this morning we're going to activate because I'm not going to just teach you all all this and talk about all this unless we go to the courtroom of heaven for you. We want to activate. How many of you want to activate today? So I believe there's things in your life that you've not seen breakthrough. Because there's been some kind of something legal, the devil's been able to hold it up. And you've ripped and tore and you've gone to, you've pulled your sword out and you've chopped the devil's head off in the spirit and you've not seen the breakthrough. I believe that we're going to have a breakthrough. Now there's always other things that, I, let me tell you something. There's many things we need to have in place in our lives. But uh, the, the word says you become a slave to sin. You become a slave to the devil. If you serve righteousness, you become a slave to righteousness. If you become a slave, if you do sin, you become a slave to sin. So that what's it talking about? You've given legal right for the devil to just eat your lunch and pop the bag too. So let's stand. And we're going to activate. Again, I'm not talking about a methodology of prayer. I'm just saying it's another realm of prayer. And all I can say is, I had results. I had results. I saw immediate, speedily results. So let's go to the courts of heaven. Father God, we come. And we come on behalf of ourselves. Or if you've got somebody out there that you want to intercede for, you just, you just be praying on behalf of there. And I'm going to ask you by faith, to. there may be something that I don't say, and you hear for whoever you're praying for, maybe it's yourself, that I want you to say that out and put it under the blood. Repent from it and put it under the blood. Okay? But we're going to deal with this corporately. So Father God, we come to your court. We thank you that the blood allows us to come. The blood that speaks better things than that of April. We thank you that we can come boldly to your throne of grace. And so we stand before you today, Lord. And we repent. We repent for things in our ancestry. We repent for things in our lives, Lord. For alcoholism the shedding of innocent blood through murder or manslaughter, God, in our ancestries or, or in our lives. We repent of those things and we put it under the blood. All of these things I'm going to list, we're going to repent from. Lying. Willful disobedience. Rebellion. Words that have been stout against you. Curses. Using your name in vain.
Touching the anointed. Speaking ill against God's anointed. Speaking ill against God's prophets. Or our ancestors that spoke will. Ill of God's prophets. And, the, and some anointed person in their lives. And we repent all that, God, and we put that under the blood. Now just take a moment. And anything you can think of that you hear the Holy Spirit saying in your life. Unforgiveness, bitterness, envy, strife, talking about elected officials. I'm really having to repent on that one. I put a double dose of blood on that one, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Anything, Holy Spirit, show us. Show us right now that we should repent of. Thank you, Lord. Taking the anointing for granted. Taking the call on our lives for granted, Lord. We put that under the blood. We repent of it. Religious traditions that were not biblical. Lord, we repent and put that under the blood. False accusations against another person. Or getting in agreement with false accusations of another person. Premarital sex. Adultery. Thoughts of adultery. So we repent of those things now. Now, Lord, we thank you. And we say you're the righteous judge of all, and we speak to our destinies. And, Lord, I speak over these people here, and if, you, if there's something who you're praying for and there's something that comes up in your spirit about a destiny of somebody you're praying for or a word that's been spoken over your life, you speak it out. So now in the name of Jesus, I speak to these people's destinies here in this church today, God. I speak, Jeremiah 29, 11 says, you know the plans and the hopes that you have for us. Plans and hopes to give us a future, to prosper us, and to give us a, a good outcome. And so I speak that over their lives, that they will fulfill the book of destiny that's written in their lives, that they will be soul winners and great disciples and followers of you, Lord. I speak prosperity over their businesses that they, will, that they will step out in faith and walk in a great faith and obtain obtain the promises of God I speak over their marriages Lord over their lives we speak with long life you will satisfy them and show them your salvation Lord, your book of destiny is not a short life, but a long life. You tell us that you'll give us long life till we're satisfied. So we speak that over each and every one of them. And health, Lord, we speak health over them. We speak diseases. And Lord, all of the, the doctor prognostication that's been spoken over family members and over us, and over our children and over anybody else that we know of. Friends, God, we come against those prognostications. And we release, we, we put that under the blood. Those words that have been spoken over, we put those under the blood. We repent that we listen to it. And so now we prophesy life and health, resurrection power in their lives in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. Finances, Lord. 
There's some of you here that you get to a certain spot and you just can't push through. You're going to push through now in Jesus' name. We speak forth that their book of destiny, that they'll be prosperous, successful in their businesses, in their jobs, that they will uh, uh, elevate at their places of work. Thank you, Lord. And Lord, we put under the blood, I just heard this too, we're going to put under the blood, the blood that speaks better things than that of Abel over speaking ill about those who are in authority over you, your bosses. We repent of that, Lord, and put that under the blood. And so we prophesy advancement in our jobs that will bypass all of those who have held us back in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen.